So good morning, uh, everybody. Let me first uh, uh, thank uh, Jean-Pierre for the host and technical support for this session. And uh, please let me also thank uh, the audience. I don't, uh, I don't have any idea about the audience, but anyway, thank you all and speakers for being with us in this session, covering uh, carbon-related issues. Um, I will... Uh, it will be bring presentation on both theory and uh, empirical issues this uh, this session and we have three presentation so let me recall a little bit um, and briefly this present these presentation the first presentation reports on the political economy of fossil fuel subsidy PESA. the leading author and presenter is marisa so marisa if you would like you have uh, two or three minutes to introduce yourself uh, she is a PhD student at DIW Berlin. The second presentation will show, uh, it's more a theoretical uh, presentation, and uh, it shows how game theory and signals may enhance uh, the efficiency of uh, the tax set setting process. I'm uh, myself the leading author and presenter of this uh, paper, the second presentation. And finally, the third one, covers micro macro linkage to evaluate the distributive impacts of carbon fixation with the case on the French household. Emilien Ravigny, uh, he, he's late a little bit, but he will join us later on. A PhD student, he's the leaders, uh, uh, leading author and uh, uh, presenter of this paper. Uh, before we start, let me remind you, uh, remind the audience and speakers how this session will be organized. So we have 20 minutes presentation. Probably it's, since we have three, only three presentation, uh, presentation in this session, I will give you three or four extra uh, minutes. So followed by 10 minutes questions. We need to close this session at 11 a.m. sharply because for technical reasons, of course, and uh, I have a meeting, so I'll, uh, I need to go at 11 minus 5 or 11, it's fine. Uh, so uh, let's start now. And the first presentation, uh, uh, this is uh, Maria's presentation. Uh, please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm sharing my slides now. One second. Uh, please let me know if it works. Can you see my slides? Good. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm very happy to present uh, today and thanks uh, for being here. My name is Marisa and uh, I will be presenting joint work with uh, my colleague Francisca Holtz. We are both at the uh, German Institute for Economic Research and also my colleague Achim Hagen who is in the Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, what we are working on uh, is on the political economy of fossil fuel subsidy removal, also called phase out or reform. And we look at it both with the lenses of theory and also empirics. And also we focus on uh, presidential democracies in Latin America. So um, just very briefly, a bit of background. Uh, the removal of fossil fuel subsidies is a very, very compelling climate measure because as uh, all of you know, it goes well into the direction of pricing externalities by first, of course, removing an existing subsidy and then going into the step of, uh, for example, pricing carbon via tax or an ETS. And it's also important uh, and, and kind of very, very compelling uh, because in the countries that we are studying, basically in this developing economy setting, these subsidies have been shown by Sterner and colleagues to be regressive. This is, of course, very different in, in rich economies where the subsidies are progressive, but in these settings, they are regressive. And uh, we have also evidence that efficient pricing, that means going into the direction of um, the Gubian pricing and phasing out the subsidies could lower global carbon emissions by as much as 28%. And against this very... Uh, compelling economic case, we also observe that in practice, uh, 
the removal of these subsidies seems highly unpopular and very politically challenging. And in the imaginary, we have what happened, um, you know, in with the yellow vest in France, which was more of a of an increase in a fuel price due to a carbon tax, but a very similar setting. And also what happened in Ecuador in 2019. Uh, with the increase in fuel price this time because of a subsidy. And what happened in Ecuador is basically that the government had uh, a number of uh, widespread protests and had to finally move the location of the uh, government uh, seat to a different place due to this um, uh, uh, politically challenging setting, so to say. And what we also see is that the ex post redistribution has been shown to be quite challenging. So there is evidence that indeed uh, compensating households does always lead to some uh, losers, even if you know the, the compensation is done kind of like with the best uh, scheme possible. And what we observe is that indeed the subsidies persist in the post Paris area. So this is basically the motivation. And in this paper, what we do is we ask ourselves, what are the, these costs? So what are the political costs of removing the subsidies? And uh, to answer this question, we evaluate what are the effects of increasing gasoline prices as a consequence of the subsidy removal on presidential approval ratings? And we look at the heterogeneity of this policy. That means we look at two cases, a gradual phase out in Mexico versus a one shot phase out in Bolivia. And uh, up until here, we have a little bit of a uh, uh, puzzle. So the puzzle is why is it at all unpopular to remove su subsidies in these settings where subsidies have been shown to be regressive and where we also have settings with high levels of inequality and high levels of poverty, right? So it's a little bit puzzling that this is indeed the case. And so to answer this second question of why, we use a simple probabilistic voting model of redistribution and then we test the model predictions with empirical evidence. Basically what we do in this second part is we test if we can see the same uh, effect or the same cost by um, different income group households. So uh, the contribution is that uh, what we aim to contribute to the literature is that by taking advantage of this kind of unexpected policy announcement of the phase out, we economically estimate this cost and uh, our focus on the phase out of an environmental harmful policy uh, provides an alternative approach to this traditional focus in the literature, which focuses mostly on phase, out, phase in of environmental policies. And of course, the dynamics can be quite different, right? So um, this goes also in the direction of this behavioral economics of the endowment effect, like having something that is taken away from you can it be more or less costly than kind of like the opposite? And also we assess a complementary explanation of why this uh, phase out is so unpopular. There have been some uh, explanations in the literature. For example, this group of authors, Overland and co-authors say that um, it is highly unpopular because the subsidy is kind of a very visible redistribution mechanism that arrives uh, no matter what so to say, and also other authors such as Calvekin and Silent say that um, the more uh, beliefs are about environmental consequences of you know, climate change and so on, the less unpopular the subsidy is. So what we bring to this literature is that we take a look at what role do the ideological preferences play across different if, uh, income groups. And you will see what I mean in a second. I know this can sound a little bit abstract now, uh, but you will see what I mean in, in a little bit. So um, we focus in Latin America and the reason for this is that uh, in the past there has been widespread use of these fossil fuel subsidies. And in several of these cases, uh, the countries have been at some point oil producers. Um, so this is basically one of the reasons why the subsidies are there. And very important for our setting is that the subsidies are implicit. So that means that they are not, um, you know, decided like next year or next month, we're gonna put a subsidy of 20 cents per, per liter. This is not decided like that. 
in fact, is not decided at all. So actually the subsidies just result as a gap between a very stable and fixed uh, price, which is typically set by the government in a non-market setting, and an international price of reference that is, of course, variating. So basically, the gap between these two prices makes of implicit subsidies. And the idea is that uh, if a country has, let's say, a regulated monopoly and a regulated price domestically, it goes abroad and buys, for example, gasoline, very expensive, and sells it domestically cheaper, and that difference is this implicit subsidy gap. Um, there has also been various subsidy reform efforts. You know, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Mexico are some examples of this. And uh, we focus in the case of Bolivia and, Equ and Mexico because it allows us to compare these uh, two extreme cases of like gradual phase out versus a one shot. And importantly, fiscal pressures has been kind of like the main driver and it has been quite like exogenous to environmental policy of this, um, of this uh, yeah, phase out scheme. And importantly, uh, we focus in this region because of the predominance of presidential democracies. As you know, uh, not only the Americas have this large fossil fuel subsidies on the consumer side, uh, in other regions, in Arabic countries, uh, we have similar settings. However, here we have the advantage of being able to use this outcome variable, which is the presidential approval ratings. And also very important is this last point here that the person at the top of the state and government, the president is deciding on these fields. So the, the other uh, face of the coin here is that the consumers, whenever they see a price change, they know that this is uh, a political, a policy decision taken by the preferences, by the president, sorry. So we can very nicely link a change in price to our main outcome variable, which is the presidential approval ratings. And I'm sure you've all seen uh, this variable before, for example, in TV, on the newspapers, approval ratings just indicate which percentage of the population approved the job that the president is doing. And this variable is important because it also correlates with the intention to vote among other things. All right, so now we go to uh, what we do. So our methodology is to use the synthetic control design or the synthetic control method, which basically what it helps us to do is to reconstruct a counterfactual. In other words, we can observe Mexico, you know, before treatment and after treatment. So before the phase out and after the phase out, but we cannot observe the Mexico had it not uh, phased out the subsidy. So the idea of the synthetic control is simply to reconstruct that counterfactual. And how it is done? It is done using a convex combination of those countries that had a similar trajectory in the outcome, but that did not select into that particular treatment. So we build the synthetic control for these two countries separately, one for Mexico, one for Bolivia. And this is more or less like what the treatment looks like. And this is kind of like an event study um, sort of uh, graph. What you can see on the left hand side is the case of Mexico, where the treatment is a gradual phase out that started towards the end of uh, 2009 with gradual price hikes of around 1% to kind of gradually phase the subsidy. What we can also observe is that there seems to be also a reduction in presidential approval ratings. However, yeah, how much is this due to kind of like a previous trend or to the actual phase out? This is what we need to test with the, with the synthetic control method. And similarly here in, in Bolivia, we have a phase out as well. The difference is that this was a one shot or one off phase out that started towards the end of 2010. And the, here the price change was around 70% price change. So here, of course, as probably expected, we, we see a much higher reduction in the approval ratings. But again, we need to test this uh, with the synthetic control method. And to do so, we build a balanced quarterly panel data set for 14 Latin American countries plus. The plus is because the US is also there. And this data set goes from the end of the 2000s towards the uh, 2018. Our main outcome variable is, this, as I told you, the presidential approval ratings. However, we do small transformations. So we mean centered by presidential term. 
that basically means that uh, we kind of take some sort of fixed effects by presidential term. And this just allows us to control for things like relative popularity of presidents. And uh, we also have our predictors, which our main predictor is the price of gasoline here. As you can see, the GDP growth, inflation, the duration of the presidential term, which has been shown in the literature about uh, political science on presidential approval ratings to be very relevant, and a set of outcome lags just to improve the fit. And the results that I'm showing you are with the uh, complete pool of countries, that means all the countries in the sample, but we play around with different pools and our results are robust to these different specifications. So here are already the results of the synthetic control uh, that, we, that we have. Uh, this is so-called the path plot and the solid line represents what actually happened in Mexico, right? So the approval ratings uh, under the, the treatment and this line just represents when the treatment starts and the dashed line represents the contrafactual or the synthetic counterpart. And so this gap, right, between these two lines after the treatment is uh, the effect that we estimate. And what we observe is that on average, approval is 14% lower than what it would have been in the absence of treatment for the case of Mexico. And for the case of Bolivia, it's uh, higher, is 18% lower than what it would have been uh, in the absence of treatment. Part of the results of the synthetic control is just checking, you know, which countries go into this, into building this synthetic control, because as I told you, it's like a convex or linear combination of countries. In the case of Mexico, Colombia has a very high weight. And in the case of Bolivia, Ecuador and Guatemala have high weights. Also part of the results is uh, showing uh, how good is our uh, prediction in the pre-treatment period. In other words, we look at the predictor means, so the average of, of these variables before the treatment. And this is kind of uh, Mexico, so the treated Mexico. And we compare this against the synthetic Mexico. And these two numbers for all the variables should be quite close, which is the case. So this gives us confidence in our, in our result. And also importantly is that this is sort of a weighted average, right? The synthetic control. That means that the synthetic control should be an improvement to the kind of very simple or linear average, which is a sample mean. And this is also the case. Um, and then uh, we run a number of robustness and placebo tests, which I'm not gonna go in detail just in the sake of time, but I'll be happy to, to come back to this if, if you like me to do so. So up until this point, what we have found is that indeed there are uh, costs, you know, political costs of this removal of subsidies. And the question in this setting with high inequality and regressive subsidies is why is it so unpopular? And so to answer this question, we use a model. We use a probabilistic voting model of redistributed fossil fuel subsidies. And in this model, we have uh, an environment with two parties, parties A and B, and also an electorate. And each party choose a party platform, alpha A. Alpha A is just how much of the total budget is spent on subsidies, like which share of the total budget goes to subsidies. And basically these parties don't care about anything, just about, uh, maximizing the probability of winning elections. And on the electorate, we have voters. So for example, a voter I in income group J has preferences over a party platform alpha J. So they have also a preference uh, for, for the level of subsidy. And they also have Xi IJ ideological preferences. Uh, this uh, Xi IJ, we assume it to be uniformly distributed across this range. And basically, we can think of this number as, a, as an ideological preference. And if this number is high, uh, high and positive and very close to this range, that means that the, uh, there is a preference for party B. And if it's negative and very close to this number, there means that there is a preference for party A. So we have several stages in our model. First, parties announce their platforms. There is the relative popularity, which is uh, realized. Elections take place and then the policies are implemented. We solve this uh, by backward induction. And the main result of this model is that the parties will cater to those undecided voters. 
In other words, they will cater to those that are not in the extreme or to those that are very close to the median voters. In other words, the parties will cater to those income groups which have kind of like a high density or a majority of voters close to the median voter. And um, so to, to uh, let me just check the time, just to make a little bit of intuition from this result, uh, we have here in this inequality that voter I in group J will prefer the party A if its welfare under the policy proposed by the party A is larger than its welfare under the policy of party B. Given its uh, ideology, the ideology of the voter in that income group, and also giving a term for relative popularity. Uh, so the, the parties know this, right, this inequality. Let's say that I'm party A and I know and I observe this. So uh, let's say that this say I is positive and very, very high. So this is a, an extreme voter that prefers B. And because of its ideology, this voter prefers B no matter what. So uh, what the model says is that in this case, party A will never cater to the, this voter because it's already decided to vote for B no matter what. So no matter what the choice of alpha is for A, uh, this voter will vote for party B. The converse can also happen so that the voter it has a very negative side and no matter what happens, it votes for party A. So as party A, if I know this, I will also never cater to these extreme voters. So I will only choose my alpha A or my level of sub C to cater to those that are uh, undecided. So from this result, we have a proposition and is that removing subsidies res will result in a loss of political support if the high income groups have moderate ideological preferences so that you know the parties cater to them and, and if the subsidies are regressive. And so if these two things happen, the loss in support is driven indeed by these high income groups. With these results, what we go is we go into the data again and try to see if we find support for these model predictions. And the results that I'm gonna show you are only on Mexico. So they are preliminary in that sense. Um, but we will go kind of step by step. To these results, we use the America's Barometer and also the National Expenditure Survey of, of Mexico. So um, what we show is, or what we, we aim to show is uh, that indeed this uh, phase out the, the unpopularity and the cost is driven by the high income households and that uh, the high income households have higher voter density around the median. So they have more undecided voters and also uh, that subsidies are regressive. So by looking at the data, what we observe is that if we group uh, the income groups into quartiles, so this being the richest groups and this being the poorer groups. And if we take a look at their ideology density, so where ideology uh, here is like left and here is the right, you know, in the in the left right spectrum, we observe that indeed the high income groups uh, are more concentrated around the median, and um, whereas the low income groups are not so much. And here we have kind of like the black uh, being in the rise, where this is of course not uh, in line with the other observations. We also observe that in line with results of Sterner and others the subsidy seems to be highly regressive, meaning that uh, the fuel expenditure is higher for those high income groups and lower for the low income ones. And finally, what we do is a, a very kind of standard if and if approach to see if we can find heterogeneous effects by these different income groups. So we take the approval and we have our treatment, our post dummies and our Treat times post. So this beta three here is the difference in difference estimator that we want to observe. And we also have a series of controls. This data on the uh, Latin American barometer is kind of very rich. So we can control for the perceived economic situation, corruption, safety, and ideology. And uh, in this different diff approach, the control group for Mexico is Colombia. And this is based on the previous result on the synthetic control. So uh, this is uh, close to my final slides. Uh, these are the results on the income groups. Here, uh, what we observe is that the first two 
poorest income quartiles do not show a significant effect. So the effect is zero and also insignificant in both cases. So meaning that we do not observe a change uh, in approvals for these two groups. In the third quarter, we observe a negative change. So it is unpopular to their eyes that the subsidy is phased out, but this effect is insignificant. And finally, in the fourth or richest quarter, we observe a negative and significant effect. So uh, this confirms our uh, model prediction so far, as I said, this is preliminary, that low income groups are not responsive to fossil fuel subsidy removal, while high income groups do disapprove the president as a result of the removal. So finally, uh, uh, my last slide, uh, we, did, we did find evidence indeed of a negative effect on uh, the removal of the subsidies on presidential ratings, yet with different magnitudes depending on the design, if this is kind of gradual or uh, one shot phase out. In our theoretical model and also this related empirical findings, also uh, suggest that the loss in support is indeed driven by the high income groups. If these two conditions, the moderate ideological preferences and the regressive subsidies are met. And finally, a little bit of also relatively preliminary uh, policy relevance is that indeed it seems that a gradual phase out will, um, will show less resistance uh, and in combination with other compensation measures that could be a feasible uh, policy. And thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for this uh, very clear presentation and uh, very interesting topic. So uh, do you have any question uh, the audience? Probably, oh, Emilia is in, which is very good. Uh, can I ask a question? Please. I, I seem to have missed a few, uh, I, um, a few consider that the percentage of voters don't understand the policy that is going to be enforced. So uh, when you talk about voter, voter uh, uh, when you talk about uh, approval ratings, for example, not just for fossil fuel subsidies, but for other types of uh, uh, for other types of uh, policies, sometimes the voters do not understand the complete nature of the policy. So I wanted to ask if you take that into account or you plan to take that into account. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, th thanks a lot for that question. I think this is indeed very relevant because one of the kind of assumptions that we rely on is that the consumers do not observe the subsidy as you rightly point out but they do observe the price changes, right? And that's the reason why we only use directly the price of gasoline, which in this case is increased and not the, the subsidy because yeah, as, as we mentioned, this is an implicit subsidy. And indeed when the international price of reference, which in the Mexico case, for example, is the Gulf um, price in the, in the US, um, when this increases, the subsidy automatically increases, but of course the public is not aware of this, right? The government with their accounts, they are aware of this, but not the public itself. So uh, this is what allows us also to, to really kind of identify the effect of a change in price on, on approval ratings and not so much directly the subsidy. And that's why we are framing it as we uh, are assessing just the effect of a change in price as a consequence of the subsidy removal. And also key is that before that time, there were no changes in prices, only um, adjustments for inflation. So if we see it at, at that line of the price, you basically see a kind of like a fixed line and then poof, suddenly increasing. So this also allows us uh, to, to, to do this specification in the econometrics. Yes. But in any, but you. in any case, the public will pay a little bit uh, indirectly via taxation, right? Exactly. That's, so, that's the idea. So the that... public is aware about that. Yeah, exactly. So there and that's... is some 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 changes, huge changes in the in the international prices. So at one time, they, you can you, you you have to finance all that, right? Oh, you mean uh, exactly either by transaction or debt, and uh, some way you have to finance that exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, you know that this fiscal pressure was growing because. The subsidies were growing and they were not accounting for this before. So the fiscal pressure was higher and higher and that's why they decided to phase them out. Uh, mm -hmm. Sadly, not so much because of the environmental reason, but yeah. 
and how the public react to this to such such uh, uh, I mean I mean increase in the in the fiscal pressure. So that's the thing. Our kind of underlying hypothesis is that they do not observe that directly the public. Um, however, what we have been thinking about, if we get the data, is to control also for that, for let's say public debt. And if we're able to, to kind of collect the data, we will include it as one of our controls. Maybe I missed something. Uh, <clears throat> oh, let's see the audience first. Uh, another question, please, from the audience. No questions. So I'll put you. Uh, maybe I missed something. Why you choose Mexico and Bolivia? Do you have any justification, any reason for this choice? Um, the reason is that these were kind of like the two extremes. So Mexico mm -hmm. is one of the few cases, if not uh, the only one, the, the only case for gasoline prices uh, for a gradual phase out. There is another case of a gradual phase out, but it's in gas and it's in Argentina. And so we felt that this comparison of these two extreme cases would make sense, you know, Bolivia with the one shot and Mexico with the gradual one. There is, however, several cases of one shot phase out. I mentioned also Ecuador. However, this happened like much more late than our data uh, availability. So that's kind of like both the combination of the data availability and those, these two extreme examples. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, I have one more question, actually. Sorry, please, to interrupt please, you. Please. Uh, do you take into account the? Uh, you you were talking about when you showed the graph that there was a, a point in time where the subsidies were removed, and then you looked at the approval ratings. Uh, did you look at uh, socio socioeconomic and political uh, events that happened in the same or around the same time period that can directly affect also voter okay okay no this no this no no this was <laughs> okay. thank yes thanks for yeah. the question and so the answer is uh, we control so far for uh, GDP, uh, for economic variables such as GDP growth and inflation, and also for this kind of um, what we call duration of the presidential term. In the past, it has been shown that duration is very important because first the president is kind of very loved and there's the honeymoon effect, and then the approval goes down and then again up. So this is what we are controlling for. However, one thing that we are not able to control for are those, all of these kind of like events such as like corruption scandals and uh, these sorts of things. And this is the reason why you can see a little bit jumps in the data in our kind of prediction. Um, this, however, I mean, unless we have like a super detailed, you know, a dummy variable, which would probably not help so much we will not be able to kind of capture all the variance in that data. So, so far we have kind of like the most important relevant um, predictors in the previous literature, but of course there is some of the variation that is still, you know, unexplained. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, One last question. Oh, Jean-Pierre. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Now, uh, I, I, I have a simple question concerning how to manage, how you managed uh, uh, adverse shocks like 2008, 2009, uh, Great Recession. How do you manage this in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in your uh, empirical work? Yeah, these are both controlled with this, um, basically with the controls in the regression, which is the GDP growth. So in mm -hmm. a way, whenever we're controlling for GDP growth, we kind of uh, remove all of the variation in approval that is explained by the GDP growth or 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 the opposite, like the, the D growth. Uh -huh. Yes, so um, that's included there. And we also control for, for inflation, which might follow kind of, I don't know, different patterns depending on how it's managed in the country. And we have these two control there. Assuming that the policy is the same in, in Latin America or in the in your, in your uh, sample, right? Uh, assuming that the policy, policy is the same, I... but the no, we control for each uh, GDP growth of all the countries in the sample. So we have the GDP growth data for all the countries in our sample, and we're controlling for those uh, variables. Yes. 
So for each single right. country, you have the data on their GDP uh, and economic development, yeah. But these countries didn't use the same political economy policy, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. During so, this yeah, and this is an excellent point. So by basically by having the GDP growth for each of the countries, let's say that in the case of Mexico, Colombia is the relevant control, and we are also control for GDP growth for both Mexico and Colombia, we are taking this already into consideration that they have both different economic policies. Yeah. And right. the method, what the method does, it is selects, you know, the synthetic control method selects those countries that are most similar to Mexico and that are able to kind of, you know, replicate the, before the treatment, the kind of trajectory of Mexico. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So if we Thank don't you. have uh, more questions, um, I will, uh, oh, Emilia is in, Emilia. Oh, I'm sorry, Junko, you have Thank a you. question. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you very much. I, I'm Junko Ogawa from the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. Thank you very much for your great presentation. And uh, I'm living in Asia and uh, uh, especially South Asian countries, is facing same problem that they try to reduce uh, or get rid of subsidies uh, uh, fuels. But sometimes uh, it, when the government try to uh, get rid of those subsidies, people went to violence that they try to against, that they try to keep uh, their subsidies on the fuel uh, their oil or natural gas and other fossil fuels. And in your presentation that you said that the, there need to be some uh, compensation if you try to uh, try to um, uh, get rid of subsidy. So what is in your mind that uh, what kind of uh, comp uh, compensation uh, should be necessary? What what and uh, so that the people can accept uh, the accept the get a reading of subsidies. Thank you yes, very much. Uh, thanks a lot for this question. Um, and this is indeed kind of like the golden question because uh, so far in our paper we don't address this uh, directly. But what uh, we know also from the literature is that. Um, compensating is really, really difficult, even if we do kind of like a cash transfer with the best possible design, you know, that is decoupled from the from the regional subsidy and that is based on other uh, determinants, there are always losers to these um, transfers. So that's why we were, uh, towards the end of our presentation, arguing that uh, a combination of the gradual phase out with some uh, transfer schemes and compensation schemes would be the best. Uh, we do not go into the detail uh, so far in the paper and yeah this is still also for us uh, and in the literature in, in general uh, a relevant question but the key uh, kind of uh, literature that uh, we use here is from Saleh and uh, he addresses this question more into detail um, and he indeed finds that trying different compensation mechanisms based on different characteristics there is always a group that is going to be a loser um, and there is not a perfect compensation scheme. So yeah, but thanks a lot All for right. the question. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. We, need, we need to go forward. Of course, if you have any question, more questions or remarks, please feel free to send uh, uh, our speakers uh, an email. Uh, so you have uh, the emails on, on the website, right? Um, if you want, uh, if you have to leave at uh, five minus uh, at uh, eleven minus five, I can continue with the session to uh, right. answer some questions for in the twenty remaining minutes. All right, no, no problem. But maybe I, I would like to ask Emilia if he has some uh, constraint. So probably he can present now. I I'll present later. It's up to him. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you so again for being late. I have a class at the same time, but now it's fine. I can stay until the end of the session and I'm very glad right. to give you your session classes. No problem. Thanks Good. for asking. Let me upload my presentation. So is it fine with you all? 
you can see it. All right. Yeah, so uh, again, for uh, the audience, welcome uh, in this uh, carbon issue session. Uh, my paper, uh, our paper is uh, concerned more uh, environmental taxation, information precision and information sharing. And it's a uh, theory-based uh, uh, paper. It's in line with uh, an old paper we published in uh, 2018 concerning uh, uh, the, the social value of public information. Um, my two authors, uh, Wasim Daher and uh, Yigit from uh, New Zealand, um, we are working on these topics uh, for years now, and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna show you how uh, we can enhance uh, the tax uh, the tax uh, uh, setting process. So I'm not going to uh, uh, recall or remind you uh, what uh, the environmental economists done uh, already, but mainly we have. Uh, uh, two kinds of instruments uh, to correct externalities. Uh, of course, we don't. We have uh, more than that. Uh, Marisa talked about subsidies. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking in this paper more on taxation. So we need to correct uh, uh, externalities to put some price on uh, emissions. And uh, this is uh, uh, the only way, I think, to uh, drive down emission and uh, uh, to reduce externalities. So probably we, you, you all know also that economic uh, uh, instrument have some advantage over some purely legal based and mandated uh, uh, actions. So uh, three, four decades now, we are uh, dealing more with the economic, uh, uh, economic uh, instrument more than uh, uh, legal instruments. So mainly we have two kinds of economic instrument, price-based and quantity-based uh, policy or instrument tools. Uh, the main purpose is to give uh, the polluter the main or the appropriate incentives to manage their externalities. Uh, so we experienced uh, taxation or uh, emission uh, taxation taxes. Uh, decades now, and we, we we have a good idea about uh, uh, about the, to deal how to deal with this taxation. But still, uh, there is uh, there is some issue, and uh, we are in this in this paper we're gonna we're gonna raise this issue these issues how to find and how to uh, uh, make them uh, better works in reality. Um, so. You all know also that uh, polluter have no polluters have no uh, sufficient incentive to manage their emissions. So, uh, of course, uh, they don't care about the social cost of their action. Uh, uh, environmental taxes will uh, uh, give them the right incentives, and uh, uh, probably they uh, the taxes environmental taxes will give the right incentive to uh, innovate and uh, to switch to greener economy. Um, the, of course, you, you, all, you all know also that uh, under perfect condition, so it's easy to set these taxes. Uh, the Peruvian tax is well known now, and uh, uh, everybody uh, heard about that. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, uh, different difficulties, especially uh, uh, the process is shrouded by with uh, uh, uncertainties, shocks, and in fact. Uh, informational asymmetries. Uh, especially the regulator, when he's when the regulator sets uh, 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 taxes, uh, he he has he has some uh, uh, asymmetric information concerning emission, concerning costs, concerning the demand. And in this paper, we are focusing only on uh, asymmetric information concerning costs. So uh, of course, firms. Uh, 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 know uh, uh, better than the regulator uh, uh, um, than the regulator about uh, their marginal costs, and they have a greater precision about that. Um, in any case, even even though so, though I'm sorry, um, the firms may uh, uh, face uh, different kind of shocks. Uh, 
Uh, and we are dealing in this paper with two kinds of charts, what we call uh, industry-wide charts and uh, uh, specific charts. So uh, that's why we're gonna use in this paper uh, what we call the signaling gains. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we started with this point that signaling gains probably will uh, get more uh, 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 efficient taxes uh, 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 in, in reality. And uh, we got some neat uh, results, as you will see. Um, probably I will uh, skip this to uh, talk about motivation and research questions. So we set a stackelberg Kurno uh, game with uncertainties about the state of the world. And as I said already, the, the, the random variables is uh, uh, marginal costs. In the first period, period of course, the regulator has no information about uh, the marginal costs. So uh, the regulator will set the tax and this tax will remain in force for a period of time. And then in the second period, facing what we call industry-wide or common shocks uh, and firm-specific shocks, private signals, uh, firm would compete in the marketplace to produce uh, 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 the output. The output will be probably energy or electricity or whatever. Uh, so in this setting, you, you, you will see that the regulator he has some information deficit uh, with regard what we uh, the rival firms has uh, have. I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the marketplace. This is my roadmap. So uh, I will start with the model setup and then the timing, then. We're gonna see and discuss a little bit uh, the optimal policy. And uh, more precisely, I will add a section about information sharing, collusion, and welfare consequences uh, uh, about taxes and some word of uh, to conclude. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to leave you all the uh, literature on taxation. You know well that uh, pricing collusion have been explored in depth. Uh, the literature is huge, very huge on that, starting, of course, the work of Weizmann in uh, goes back 1974 and 78. Uh, in this paper, we're going to add a little bit uh, some new issues, some new matters by considering signaling gains. And uh, uh, we put some uh, uh, high premium on statistical appearances in setting the policy. So, as I said, firm receive, firms receive uh, uh, two kinds of signals, a private one and a common value uh, one. Uh, and which is very interesting in this paper too, we step away from any kind of distribution, which means that in the literature, uh, uh, authors mainly consider a Gaussian uh, distribution. So, uh, since we have linear uh, demand, as you will see, and linear costs, um, we, know, we don't need to specify the distribution function of uh, the random values. Uh, so uh, a very important point, the application, as I said, so we can, uh, this model may be, uh, may, may be applied to uh, uh, different kinds of uh, markets. Let me just Recall two two examples or uh, the 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 uh, for example the energy sector in the U.S. market or the uh, the the European uh, energy market. It can uh, also be applied to the chemical industry in the factoring in the U.S. Uh, uh, this is a two examples uh, uh, as application of our uh, model. Um, the basic elements of uh, our our uh, uh, paper, our model. So we consider to simplify the presentation, a linear demand. We can generalize, generalize this, uh, it's easy. And we consider we consider only duopoly. So we have two firms. Uh, this point, we can uh, uh, simplify it. Uh, we can, we can uh, deal with uh, oligopoly we, without any, any uh, difficulties. As I said, we considered also that uh, 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 we have linear uh, uh, marginal costs, and more specifically, uh, uh, we define that uh, uh, the emissions are uh, feed 
primes uh, uh, the quantities, the output. This is the second, uh, the second relation uh, uh, in this slide. And the uh, environmental damage, uh, the letter uh, uh, D, is uh, the sum of, uh, uh, of course, uh, individual emissions. Information, the information structure, as I said, uh, we have two kinds of signals. So the marginal costs, this is the first uh, equation on this slide, is the sum of two signals. S is a common one. Uh, so we call this the industry-wide chart. And we have some private signal, epsilon i. It is a firm-specific chart. We know, and the regulator too, of course, <clears throat> that these variables have some mean and variance, and we have the precision, which is uh, the inverse of uh, uh, the values. So, Demo one, a very interesting uh, uh, result based on uh, uh, our paper published in 2018 and a very old uh, theorem, uh, Erickson in 1969. Uh, this lemma uh, states uh, the following, that any firm in the marketplace may infer uh, the marginal cost of the rival based on its own information about its own marginal costs. In other terms, since we have linear marginal costs and linear demand, the conditional expectation of my uh, uh, marginal costs, given the marginal cost of Jean-Pierre or Emilia, will take this following linear form. And it's very easy to demonstrate this, uh, this lemma, and I can send you the paper if you wish. So please send me a, a, uh, uh, an email and uh, I will forward the, uh, the, the whole paper. It's a 50 pages paper, so uh, I, I can send it to you without any problem. So the meaning of the, this lemma is very interesting. So in, in, in other terms, in simple terms, this means that costs or signals are affiliated. So if I have a better uh, 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 information about my marginal costs. So this means that the probability, probability that Emilia or Jean-Pierre or Marisa has also a better information about her uh, uh, or uh, his uh, uh, um, marginal costs. <clears throat> so this is uh, what we call uh, signals are affiliated with a linear uh, uh, relation as given in the model. The timing of the game, uh, Jean-Pierre, please uh, feel free to uh, remind me if I uh, I go over 20 minutes, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, the timing of the game, so we have two periods, but we have different stages. At the first stage, as I said, uh, we have a leader in the market where uh, the leader is the regulator and uh, uh, he sets or he, she sets whatever uh, the, the, the tax rate in order to maximize what we call a social welfare function. I will define it later, later on. Uh, of course, before the realization of the uh, random variables. In the second stage of the game, so we have the common component will be drawn randomly. The third stage of the game, uh, the private signal will be drawn uh, randomly, but this, uh, uh, this private signal is only uh, known by, uh, by the, the firm itself, but not the rival. And finally, we have uh, uh, a Cournot game in the marketplace, and the rivals will produce the quantity uh, of uh, the output. Since we have uh, uh, what we call the triple linearities, linearity, I'm sorry, um, which is a, a linear demand function. We have linear uh, uh, marginal costs and we have linear, uh, uh, linear uh, uh, expectation, conditional expectation. Uh, this is, I used a, a we used a result, um, 
I think it's Journal in, of Mathematical Economics published in 2010. Uh, we know well that uh, uh, the, the, the equilibrium is unique and will uh, take a linear uh, form. And this is uh, uh, the form of uh, our uh, equilibrium. So the quantities are given at the second stage of the game uh, uh, is given by this relation. So of course, some, uh, some calculus uh, give, give us uh, uh, theta i and theta, uh, theta i1 and theta i2. Now, at the first stage of the game, uh, the, the regulator and given the best response function uh, at the second uh, period of the game, uh, the regulator needs to maximize this uh, uh, welfare function. So what we have? We have consumer surplus. We have the damage, of course, environmental damages. We have uh, also uh, uh, profit, the sum of profits of both firms, and we have uh, revenues uh, and some weight. In the, the L uh, term is the indirect, indirect social benefits of environmental taxation, which is the double dividend. Uh, if you uh, if you uh, remind uh, remember this. Uh, uh, work, uh, the work of, uh, uh, it was back in uh, 1995, I think, uh, about uh, uh, the first dividend and the second dividend, the environmental dividend uh, of uh, uh, taxation. What is the environmental policy given this uh, uh, model, this uh, setting? So uh, we did the calculus, and this is the pricing policy, which means uh, we have two kind of uh, uh, tax rate. And the tax rate is the sum of two terms. If you uh, see that we have the sum, the, the, the first term is a common term for both, for both uh, firms. And we have a different term, the second one. Uh, and this term uh, will uh, allow us to differentiate emission taxes between firms. If the regulator uh, do not, uh, does not have any information and he has only or she has only the signal, so he or she may use this signal to differentiate taxes and this is, will be an efficient uh, tax rate instead of having a rule of thumb and apply the same tax intensity for both for both uh, firms. Um, so this is a very interesting interesting result because uh, uh, we get some uh, uh, differentiated taxes and in the literature and uh, I think in uh, there is a paper published in the Energy Journal goes back to 2019. Uh, the authors uh, 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 mentioned and highlighted that we need today to differentiate taxes to reduce emission and to uh, reduce externalities. Uh, Jihad, um, I think, sorry to cut you, but I think we can uh, allow for five more minutes or uh, uh, a little bit more, five, between five and seven minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more uh, result, very interesting result, is how to deal with information percent. And the question is, if we have more precise information, how this information, the precision of the information, will impact uh, uh, social welfare? Very interesting uh, result that if the uh, W, or whatever you call it, uh, omega here, um, which represent the uh, severity of environmental damage is between one third and four fifth. So uh, any uh, more precise information will, will decrease the expected welfare, as long as, of course, uh, W is uh, lesser uh, than four fifth. However, which is, uh, this is the, the more important things. If we have a severe damage, we may, in this case, uh, 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 find some, some uh, uh, rooms to uh, where, where information precision will increase, uh, will increase social welfare. So we did some, uh, some, uh, uh, some simulation. 
numerical simulation. And here is the, uh, the results. So we have different, uh, different values of omega, omega uh, or W, 0.85, 1, 1.3, 1.15. And as you see the black area here, this is the only area where any uh, information, more precise information will lead to uh, an increase in social welfare. Uh, this is the case, as I said, the case of severe damage. In this case, information precision will lead to uh, a better social uh, uh, welfare. Probably I need uh, to uh, uh, go very quickly on this, uh, uh, this uh, section, which is uh, information sharing and welfare consequences. So we ask ourselves today for different technical reason or security reason, we have some platform in the energy sector or the electricity sector and the uh, arrivals in the marketplace are requested to put their information on this platform. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, rivals will uh, be pushed some uh, sometimes to share their information and probably to collude, uh, uh, to have some uh, collusion uh, against the regulator. What happens in this case and uh, what are the welfare consequences? So, of course, we did the job and uh, we uh, calculate the tax rate uh, in this case. Probably this is the most important uh, slide to show you. So we asked ourselves, what are the conditions, under what condition uh, rivals will collude? And uh, uh, in this case, uh, 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 what happens uh, uh, in, the, in the marketplace? So we find, we found, I'm sorry, uh, that rivals in the market place will collude only only if they have a, 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 a high marginal cost. In other terms, if they adopt greener technologies, in that case, I'm not, uh, I have no incentives to uh, collude and to share information with the others. And the second uh, result, which is very important that if Gamma I and Gamma G, which re represents uh, uh, Gamma represents the uh, relative precision of information. If we have uh, 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 Gamma I and Gamma G very low, in that case, of course, I'm not uh, 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 I'm not in, in interested to uh, to collude or to share information if my uh, my marginal cost is low enough. Uh, Otherwise, if my marginal cost is high, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very interested to collude and uh, uh, um, to share my information. Uh, and in the, uh, if gamma i and gamma g is high enough, in that case, as you can see, there is a very small room here uh, uh, to share my information. Uh, um, two minutes, Jihad. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm concluding uh, uh, with this uh, uh, presentation. I'm sorry uh, for uh, being uh, too long. Um, despite the, uh, the, the tremendous uh, progress in the field of environmental taxation, uh, of course, we have experienced taxes. We have uh, uh, applied them in the reality. So we still today, uh, we need to apply and we need to uh, 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 do some fine tuning in order to get a, uh, a job well done and uh, to reduce emission. Of course, uh, the, 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 this word is more theory. We need to apply it. We know we need to do some empirical words. Words, I'm sorry. And probably we need to uh, relax some assumption concerning uh, 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 the demand function. In this paper, we consider a uh, homogeneous product. And we are working today on product differentiation or uh, location and the investment decision. Thank you so much for your uh, attention, and I'll be glad to answer your question. Uh, due to time issues, we can allow for a maximum of 10 minutes uh, of questions, and then we move to Emilia. All right, thank you. Yes, Emilia. 
Uh, I have a question. Then. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so you're talking about a, a tax mainly, but would it be possible to uh, reduce the um, loss of information thanks to uh, emission permit uh, auctions, for instance, where if uh, every firm reveals themselves, then because you have the process where they choose which cost they're going to announce yeah. because of the um, uh, due to the the fact that they know the cost, maybe the competitors that know as well the cost for some uncertainty. Could it be uh, paired with uh, some of that, you, you, your work? Of course, we can do it. But uh, at this time, uh, we consider only taxation, but which is a price-based instrument in our language and the language of economists. But of course, we can do the same work uh, on what we call a quantity-based, uh, which is the quotas. This is your question, right? Uh, on a quantity-based instrument. But uh, of course, we don't have enough time. That's why we need to finish at the first time uh, uh, with some restrictive uh, assumption. As I said, we consider in this paper uh, homogeneous goods. Uh, we need to see what happens if we have differentiated goods. And the next step will be uh, how signals will affect uh, the quotas or whatever, what, what, what we call uh, a quantity-based system, but we we have this in mind. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Please jump here. Um, so concerning the 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 efficiency of taxation, uh, do you uh, do you think there could be uh, a like a, um, uh, the continuation of the study could be the coupling of taxation and uh, and ETS markets, for example, or uh, things like that, where uh, uh, where marginal costs cease to be linear, and also where you have uh, information that comes in that's different for uh, both players. Thank you for this uh, interesting question. You know. Uh, the last decade, if you have a look on uh, on the literature, uh, environmental economists uh, call for what we call a hybrid or hybrid uh, two, which is a combination between a uh, uh, quota or a price based and quantity based uh, uh, quantity based uh, two. Uh, this is uh, a very nice idea. And we ask ourselves, what happens if we have uh, a combination of things? Uh, to be honest uh, with you and uh, to speak my mind without any political uh, 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 filter, uh, it's not easy to deal with this kind of information structure. It's very, very complicated. But we have this in mind, see? Uh, we yes. need to think about how to deal with the information structure if we have uh, 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 public information or common information and we have private information. So the mix of that is not easy. Yeah, I, uh, I understand. But we are, we are, we are thinking okay. how to deal with this, to okay. mix it and to have a combination of both. Okay, thank you. Thank you. More questions? All right. So probably we need to. Uh, we we go can move to Emilia. And uh, Emilia, the floor is yours. So up, uh, I can uh, share my screen. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yes. Can you see my screen, my PowerPoint? Good. Yes, perfect. Then uh, thanks for uh, having me. Uh, thank you for all the great presentation before. Uh, again, sorry for Marita for not uh, being here for, for your presentation. I would definitely read your paper. Uh, so uh, this paper is called From Factor 4 Mitigation to Zero Net Emission. and asks a question about a uh, fair transition. Is it even possible uh, relying on the French low carbon strategy? Okay, 
So uh, present first, uh, the counters the method, the model, uh, the two scenario we use, the factor four scenario and the uh, zero net emission, and then uh, two sets of uh, results. So the contest is quite simple. In uh, December 2019, the, uh, United, uh, the EU announced the objective of uh, the net emission continent by 2050 as part of this uh, policy uh, package. France has announced its 2050 roadmap to uh, reach the net emission in 2050, which is an update of the previous low carbon strategy, SNBC in French, uh, which was only a factor four policy because it was supposed to. Uh, to decrease by fourfold the emission of 1990 by 2050. So we have now a more ambitious policy. The question is, do we have, because of this more uh, ambitious policy, uh, to fear some distributive consequences? And this is really, I think, a relevant question because non, ne never have we done some, such important shift in our uh, economy on our public policies. So we cannot turn exactly to the past. To, to see what happened. And we do know, especially in France, that the social acceptability of reforms and environmental reforms is closely linked to fairness. The Yellow Vesta process two years ago uh, clearly showed us that and, uh, and other countries as well. So we're part of this uh, huge literature now, uh, trying to see um, what are the distributive consequences of environmental policies. So our methods. Uh, we want to take into account a lot of different effects. So for instance, if we have a uh, uh, carbon price, we have to have a direct effect on prices for households and availability of equipment through subsidies, regulation, and carbon prices. So it may trigger some vertical and horizontal inequalities between households. But we'll have also, due to carbon taxes and price and non-price measures, some impact on all other prices uh, because of the uh, productive branches intertwining. And of course, if we want to take into account the price impact on the households, we have to take into account the consumer cho choices impact on the economy. So we have to construct and to build a loop between the two uh, steps. So to take into account all those effects at the same time, we built a micro simulation with more than 10,000 household expansion data to have a uh, quite precise look at how they react to uh, different prices. To take into account the uh, macro um, uh, macro effects. Uh, we build a CG model, computable general equilibrium, and to build a loop, we have an iterative process that will detail later between the two uh, block micro simulation and CG. And especially to uh, be able to predict, forecast how the household will react to new uh, prices, uh, not only to energy prices, but to all of the prices, we uh, estimated long term elasticities, price, and uh, income for 14 goods, including four energy, for 40 classes of households. So we're able to predict how they will react. But it doesn't take into account uh, what we call trend working technologies that are going to be very important and disturb, distort the, um, the, the bills of households in the future. And namely, we identified three trend working technologies housing renovation and new housing construction, that is, new effort efficient, energy efficient uh, housing, because it will decrease uh, energy bills, and electric vehicles, which is a major change in mobility. So the, the new uh, uh, feature of our model is that we explicitly model beyond uh, price and income elasticities the switch to electric mobility. So we uh, model three different uh, selection of households. The most energy intensive also are the one accessing to electric mobility or the median energy intensive or the least energy intensive to see what are the effects of different selection of households to benefit from this mobility. And then we explicitly modify their budget according to the uh, eligible trips they make, that is trips under the uh, average autonomy of electric vehicles and we then modify their budget. And we do exactly the same for the um, energy efficient housing. We select the most median and least energy intensive households. Uh, and uh, of course, for the condition, if they can afford the loan to the bank to renovate. And we give priority to households, owner of their own house, public tenants, and finally, private sector tenants to reproduce the uh, well-known owner tenant uh, paradox. So we'll be able to see the impacts of such uh, measure, measures uh, of subsidies to electric mobility and uh, renovation. 
and we compare scenario where we have such information and very precise information about uh, renovation and electric mobility. We rely on the uh, French environmental agency territories where we have input output matrices where we calibrate our um, CG model, hypothesis about energy mix, carbon prices, and very precise hypothesis about uh, household investment and energy efficiency technology. So uh, the volume, how square meters, how much uh, electric vehicles, what's the price of uh, renovation of square meters from class G to class F, and expected energy saving to go, for instance, for, instance, from, for household from class uh, C to class B, in which year. So we have that from 2010 to 2035. And we compare two scenarios, the factor four with a limited carbon tax, and uh, the zero net emission scenario, much more ambitious with a more of a higher carbon tax, but also higher um, objective in terms of uh, thermal renovation, 1 billion square meters, and twice as much electric vehicles as planned by the previous uh, scenario due to a high bonus in energy um, in uh, electric vehicles. So it is quite official data that we use to calibrate our, our, our model. And then the model itself is made of two parts, as I said, a macro model, which is IMACLIM, uh, Computable General Equilibrium Model, task static, and micro data, French House sold expansion survey in 2010, the last of the cultures at the time. And so we built an iteration between um, the uh, macro model and the micro model. So from the micro model, we have income growth for wages, capital uh, revenues, and unemployment benefits. So we expand households revenues thanks to uh, this data. And we forecast how they would react in conception uh, following growth in income and growth in relative places thanks to the um, computed price and income elasticities. And then we explicitly model how the uh, electric vehicle or thermal uh, renovation will modify uh, their budget. Then we aggregate their conception. We put it back into the model. It will then modify the equilibrium. And we do that until we have consistency between the micro and the macro a view of the economy. So then uh, I'll try to spend as much time as I can um, uh, to the results, which are the very uh, much the important part there. So first, uh, we made the hypothesis of absolutely no recycling of carbon tax revenues. So any uh, money raised by the carbon tax will just come to reduce a government deficit uh, in the model. So uh, the first point to note is uh, the, we are kind of, de kind of dependent on the hypothesis made by the French Environmental Agency. So for instance, uh, emission reduction investment have uh, a gross and anything. They cause uh, the net emission to have higher GDP and lower unemployment than the factor four scenario. And more savings, and that from, comes from the uh, micro um, database due to the profitability of energy efficient uh, technologies. But the fact is, uh, even if we try to model as much at the, uh, as policy as we can, we fail to meet the objective of, for carbon reduction uh, because we only model the technology penetration and the price signal, and we cannot explicitly model the fact that people will try to reduce the consumption voluntarily, some of energy conservation program outside of any incentives. So without this incentive, non-economic incentive, we cannot meet the requirement, the objectives of the uh, trajectory. So back to uh, inequality, which is the part of the subject. Um, due to uh, the growth that we've seen here, the uh, fact that the net emission has growth in GDP, we have globally a decrease for all scenario in uh, the Gini index, so inequality of the carb of the income distribution. But we have a larger increase decrease in the factor four scenario which means that the, the um, zero net emission scenario is more unfair to the public than uh, the factor four. But in the same time, we have larger increase in the medium income versus 2010 because we have higher growth. But this distribution is also more uh, expanded where we have a tightening of the distribution where we compare this in line to medium income in factor four scenario. But again, at the same time, we have a larger increase in poverty rate in the factor four scenario than the, the, the net emission one. So we cannot really conclude about uh, what uh, scenarios are, uh, which scenario has a more impact on income distribution because 
Here, the best one is the factor four scenario, but the another scenario if you want to uh, increase medium income and reduce or limit the increase in poverty. So on those uh, limits, we can say that um, the net emission is more ambitious. It does worsen most inequalities, but it does certainly not uh, incre um, increase equity. So bite point, bite point for this um, scenario. But more importantly, um, we have to worry about the regressivity of the carbon tax, which is a well-known fact that the carbon tax put a higher share, represent higher share of uh, low income, decides share of uh, income. So in the factor four scenario, um, the uh, first uh, living standard decile pay as four times as much as the uh, last income decile in the carbon tax. And the important thing is that they were net emission through their higher carbon prices does not increase the profile that does not increase the regressivity. We still have a factor of four between uh, decile one and decile uh, 10. So it does not increase vertical inequality. But since the level is much higher, it is more likely to, um, to, to light some uh, protests and to be uh, un -social socially unacceptable. Even if it's not more regressive, it's still as regressive as it was before. So the first, so the second consequence is even if we model household adaptation through uh, price and income elasticities and some efforts have been made to uh, incentive the use of low carbon technologies, even if we target them at the um, most energy intensive households, it is not enough to overcome the type of carbon tax regressivity. It still remain regressive. More and uh, on another um, dimension, uh, if um, the net emission does not increase vertical inequalities, it does increase what we call horizontal inequalities that is on uh, dimension that are not income. It increased the uh, share of uh, carbon tax for rural households, contrary to uh, versus uh, urban households, where the profile is quite flat on the factor four tonight. So we have an increase on that report. And we do know that the rural and small cities inhabitants play the very central role in the Yellow Vest protest. So we have to take that into account very uh, seriously. And of course, uh, I was talking about the rural and urban uh, divide because uh, we've kind of proven, we've seen there that uh, it is one of the main factor um, difference, uh, different thing, um, the uh, households beyond income. There is also the type of dwelling, collective versus individual housing, but it's very much correlated to the previous indicator. Of course, if you live in the countryside, you're more likely to have an individual house than if you live uh, in a big city, that is obvious. Um, but we can also uh, see that um, the uh, horizontal inequalities are more important uh, in the uh, first uh, living standard decides than in the last. For instance, we have a plus 75 uh, percent on carbon tax bill for rural outside for decile one compared to decile wine, one urban household. So very large uh, gap, uh, urban rural gap for the uh, first income design. So uh, for the uh, remaining of the presentation, we'll, uh, when we talk about horizontal inequalities, we'll mainly be talking about this uh, divide between rural and urban households. And the, uh, one of the um, things we were able to test with our model is how the distribution and the selection of um, beneficiaries of low carbon technologies, renovation and electric vehicles, can help reduce um, inequalities. We've seen that overall it's not enough, but maybe it goes in the right direction. And indeed, indeed, it does. If we look at the maximum energy saving, where we select the most uh, energy intensive households to benefit from the uh, low carbon innovation. It does reduce uh, carbon bills compared to the uh, scenario where we select the already efficient households, which is actually kind of the case in France where the uh, households uh, buying electric vehicles are already uh, rich and efficient households uh, using their car uh, not that much and 
uh, having already efficient car. So this maximum energy saving uh, scenario does reduce horizontal inequality. We have, you have less difference between rural and urban households uh, in this scenario than in the minimum energy saving scenario. So that's a good point for uh, subsidies, electric vehicle and automation subsidies. They're going the right direction to reduce horizontal inequalities. But at the same time, you can see that it does flatten the uh, profile uh, and making the, the carbon tax bill quite similar for high income desires and low income desires compared to minimum energy savings. So if one rich household pay exactly the same bill as a poor household, it means that the uh, share of income dedicated to uh, carbon tax for the, the lowest household is much more higher, much higher than for the uh, household. So that means we have more vertical inequalities. So electric vehicles and renovation subsidies targeting the right uh, and the most energy intensive households does increase vertical inequalities. But those technological incentives do play their role. They decrease uh, carbon tax and in the medium long term. If you look at the medium carbon tax payment uh, between 2030 and 2035, it falls because some households have benefited from technological incentives and switch to low carbon technology. So even though the tax is still rising during those five years, the, minimum, the mean carbon tax payment actually decreases. So that means it works to decrease uh, emissions, um, mainly because uh, electric vehicles benefit more, uh, mostly uh, middle income classes uh, because they are the most uh, car using uh, households. Thermal renovation on the other side target mostly low income households, but they are not uh, fully profitable because the investment is much higher than for electric vehicles. So uh, the effects are uh, take more time to uh, be felt into the, um, the trichrome. So we do need to wait between 15 and 20 years to feel the first effect of the ecological incentive. So it does work because in the end, if no one is paying any carbon tax, then there is no equity issues. But in the meantime, we have to take care of vertical inequalities that are aggravated by the uh, renovation and electric vehicle subsidies and uh, of horizontal inequalities because they are aggravated by the uh, zero net emission scenario. So in the short term, the only solution available is with a rebating of carbon tax revenues directly to our source. This is a well-known solution, but on the short term, we prove that there is no other solution and certainly not energy efficient technologies. So we test four different rebating uh, for our sorts of uh, the 18 billion of carbon tax revenues in the zero net emission scenario. If we make a lump sum where we give the same amount to every household, it makes the carbon tax progressive, progressive excuse me. And um, uh, of course, if we uh, target more uh, intensively the, uh, re the rebating, the recycling of the carbon tax to the poorest households, then we have a very progressive profile, which is more socially acceptable. Uh, we tried uh, a rebating where we focus the uh, rebate on, on rural households, but it does concentrate uh, compensation on a very small number of uh, house, uh, households. And uh, people living in the countryside are not uh, mostly in the first income decides, so it does not make uh, the carbon tax progressive. So we'll focus mainly on the poverty targeted rebate because it's the only one that is able to reduce gene index, reduce poverty, and ensure that at least 80% of the bottom three income decides are at least compensated by the rebate. So they have nothing to lose and all to win with the reform. But this uh, rebate, poverty targeted, is uh, inefficient to ensure social justice for the rural households on the short term. So we may imagine, we have not done that yet, uh, a, com a combo of poverty targeted rebate and rural targeted rebate to manage a two dimension at the same time. And of course, we have some uh, macro effect because if you uh, 
put back 18 billion uh, euros in the economy, of course, you'll have a rebound effect in GDP and only a small rebound effect in emission, 3%, which is uh, quite a small price to pay for, um, for uh, social justice uh, on the short term and having uh, the transition actually be done, not freeze frozen as, uh, as it is now. So in conclusion, I think I've uh, run out of time. Uh, our, um, our methodology can help to take account, into account the rebound effect, as we've seen, in emissions, the uh, retrocession schemes and how we uh, give it to rebate uh, carbon tax revenue to our source, and the explicit distribution of the energy efficient technologies and how the selection of our source to benefit from exactly the same number of electric vehicles can have major uh, implication from the distributive point of view uh, on, the, on the transition. And of course, uh, vertical and horizontal inequalities. And then to conclude, it is possible to have a more ambitious strategy, so net emission compared to factor four, and have it actually be fairer to the public. But to do so, you need the combination of two tools, the carbon tax recycling, which is very efficient in the short term uh, because it benefits low-income households and help reduce poverty, and technology incentives that they only work on the mid and uh, long term to uh, reduce horizontal inequalities and reduce overall uh, carbon emissions. So we need two of them uh, to be uh, put at the same time in a policy package. So we shouldn't really only focus on carbon tax, but really think about the uh, low carbon strategy uh, as a whole. Okay, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, working paper is uh, available on uh, the website conference and uh, in the website if you uh, can't find it. Thanks, I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you so much for your rich and uh, very interesting uh, work. Uh, let me ask you a direct question. So are we expecting to see the Yellow Vest again and soon in, in France? Um, it really depends because um, due to the first protest, um, the government has decided to freeze the carbon tax to the uh, 18, uh, 2018 level. So uh, if the strategy now on is just to keep it going and to replace carbon tax with uh, energy techno efficient technologies incentives that we've seen is not enough to reach the targets and so at some point they need a new carbon tax so if they can't implement uh, uh, and prove it is a fair strategy yes most definitely we'll have the carbon uh, the yellow vest uh, again so that's why it's very important uh, we'll try to put that um, give the, the paper and uh, how we search the attention of the presidential candidate for next year to say if you want a carbon tax and we need one, it is very important to plan and to communicate ahead about distributive consequences and how you address them before it's too late. Uh, I you. think Maria had a question also. Yes. I was wondering about the timing because uh, I think most of the time kind of like the resistance comes from the timing. And you mentioned like your short term and mid term. Uh, uh, I wonder, I know that this is not in the frame of the model exactly, but I wonder if kind of flipping the coin, like sort of giving uh, some sort of even pre-carbon tax rebates could change the picture, you know, because I think most of the time what happens is that what you don't have in your hand is uh, you don't know if it will happen, right? So would, yeah. And, and you play around with this short and, and medium term, but I wonder what is your take on, on that? Uh, we do not model that, but uh, that's true. That there was a paper uh, by Edwin and Fabre uh, recently that say that even if you say people that you will uh, rebate and give them money if you implement a carbon tax, then they say, yes, but I don't believe the government will actually do that. So they, they're still against uh, the carbon tax. So um, yeah, a carbon tax free rebate uh, would be very interesting, but quite costly. So that's obviously the trade-off um, that, uh, that, that, that we can't model and I can't really uh, answer, but that's, that's a very good idea actually to, 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 to use the revenue for next year, which will be more important to rebate on year end 
uh, using n plus one carbon tax revenues to rebate on uh, year uh, n the the household that that we could we could test with the model. Yeah, probably you can never fully compensate, but given that you have some you know time discount, probably people nevertheless prefer to be less than compensated. You know, but have it mm -hmm. now than in the future, and so yeah. Yeah, we, we can't compensate uh, fully, but it depends who you choose to compensate. Because if we don't compensate for the richest household, for instance, we're able to, yes. to give much more mm -hmm. money, of course, to to the, um, to the poor poorest households. Which and is probably not not a question, but a comment. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, not a question, but a comment that um, I saw also some results in California a long time ago, which they did kind of a very similar strategy. And with their cap and trade and also a combination of technology adoption policies. And they found some similar things to your results, but this is like, uh, they analyzed this ex, ex, uh, exposed. And what they found is very similar to, to your results that um, although the, the, the carbon price or the, the, the yeah, it, the, the price per megawatt in that case, because it was electricity bills increased, the overall, um, you know, amount that people paid per month decreased due to these technology advancements and that kind of like increased the acceptance of the cap and trade program there and i found that interesting and kind of very related to your results right medium term that would work but there's a short unfortunately the short term we have to worry on but definitely right thank you more question from the audience no all right Probably we can, uh, what time is it? Oh, we, we can close this session. Oh, for both of you, Emilia and Marisa, probably uh, you can read, I don't know if you have any idea about uh, these two papers, Caratini and Ali, 2018 and 2019 in nature and uh, climate change, how to win public support for a global carbon tax. Uh, to conclude, just uh, I have to say that it depends on the political will. What do we want in the future? Do we need to save the Earth? Do we, do we need to, to reduce emission, uh, to save the planet? This is the main issue. If we put this uh, 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 objective or goal in, in, in our uh, perspective, so we can do everything. This is the main point. If you, if you compare Sweden or, uh, and France about the, the tax rate today, uh, carbon tax, there is a huge difference between the tax rate between Sweden and France. So it depends on the political will and it depends on the public. And the paper of Caratini published in Nature, How to Win Public Support for a Global Carbon Tax is very interesting. Uh, so uh, before we uh, we close this session, please uh, uh, let's applaud our speakers and the audience, and thank you so much for uh, uh, your presentation and your uh, assistant, uh, our host Jean Pierre. Thank you so much. So let's thank you, Jihad, for uh, thank you, Jihad, for the for chairing the session, and thank you for the presenters. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot also from my side for uh, the moderation, the excellent session. Thanks a lot. It was really nice. Thank you. Thank you all. I will stop recording. Um...